your next witness. Carolyn Christian. Recognize those photographs of Buddy throughout different times of his life, ma'am? Yes, sir. And I was tender. This is at 1199 through 1209 in Evans at this time. Any objection? What's up, y'all? all four of us. Buddy and Jason, Bud, me. That was me, Buddy and Jason, Christmas. That's Bud's mama, his granny, and Buddy when he graduated from kindergarten. But he graduated from kindergarten with his classmates. What kind of uniform was he wearing now? Just a blue, sh blue shirt with a tie. I 
they, we went to, to Coal Falls vacation. Which one is that? You went on the left or right? Uh, that, that one over I'm sorry. That one not that. Buddy. Is that his brother? Uh huh, Jason. That's Buddy who was playing the coquette game in the yard. They were just fooling around on the car, I guess. That's Buddy and Jason. That's that's me, but Buddy, that's Buddy, Jason. Well, wait, when was that? That was at his birthday party. I tried to think when it was. I don't know, it was around 13, 14 years old. That's me and Buddy, and that deer behind him. He, that's his first deer he killed. He went camping with Michael Talbert's friend. Ma'am, have you prepared a victim impact taken in this case? Yes, sir. Let me show you what's been marked as take the 1210. Is that your victim impact statement, ma'am? Yes, sir. And I would tender states to the 1210 in that. Ms. Christian, would you please read that statement as it's written, please? My name is Carolyn Christian, and I'm the mother of SPO but Christian. and training that child to be an outstanding citizen, only they, then to have that child taken away from her. There's a big board in my heart, and it hurts so bad because of the fact that I miss him so much. I miss the toes I had with him and the lives of his shirt. I still have the memories but I can't reach out and put my arms around the memory. My heart, my heart's desire is to hold him tight just one more time. But he was loved by so many people. And if you, the jury has been just five minutes with him, you would have loved him too. There would be no more birthday parties, backyard gatherings, holidays, celebrations, or other family activities to share. The laughter, hugs, guidance, advice, sense of security, and those opportunities to say, I love you forever is gone. Our family is forever broken. To say the least, the financial effect on the family has also been devastating. We find ourselves searching every day to find something that will take that pain away. And we would pay any price to have this, but the things we find never seem to satisfy that need. So we just keep taking one day at a time, hoping for an ounce of comfort. 
We desire to help others so they aren't required to suffer as we have, but we struggle just to meet our own needs. Basco Christian Jr. Sir, uh, married Carolyn Christian. Yes, sir. How long have y'all been married? Uh, Forty years. Uh, your son, Elmer Buddy Christian III. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. And you have another son named Jason, a younger son. Yes, sir. Sir, let me show you what's been marked in states exhibit 1211 through 1223. Those photographs of you and your son and members of your family, sir? Yes, sir, it is. And I would uh, offer those exhibits in the at this time. Need be served there as a laser pointer. Okay. Uh, license card. This is at the 1211. What, sir? That's a picture of me and my son. Six or eight, I'm not sure. Well, twelve. Yes, sir. Picture, buddy. Yes, sir. That's a picture, buddy. Well, thirteen. Yes, sir. That's Buddy and my other son, Jason. Which one is which? Um, this is Buddy. And this is Jason. Well, 14 is a picture of them also? Yes, sir. Well, 15. Yes, sir. Picture of them also? Yes, sir. Sixteen is a picture of Buddy. Yes, sir, it is. What was he doing in that picture, sir? Uh, he was trying out his oil. <coughs> Sorry. Well, seventeen, sir. Do you call that picture and what it was captured? Yes, sir. Um, I had just bought him that deer rifle. He wanted to go hunting. 12, 18. Yes, that's, that's a family picture. Me and my wife. Son. He's the oldest son, of course. Yes, sir. Twelve nineteen is what, sir? Yeah, that's a picture of my son, Buddy, and um, our nephew, 
uh, at Christmas time, Buddy was helping him to uh, put his toys together. Well, Swing, sir. Yeah, so that's Buddy um, in his first vehicle. Like he had the uniform, what uh, recall what kind of uniform that was, or what it was for? Yes, sir. Um, after he graduated from high school, uh, he got a job at Jefferson Ford as a uh, service manager. Yes, sir, that's a family portrait. 1223. Yeah, so that's a picture, family portrait of me and my wife and my son Jason. Uh, uh, he had just graduated from Athens Tech and then Buddy and Melissa on the right. Yes, sir. It is. And I would tend to state to the 12 swing forward to Evans at this time. And your judge. No, sir. No. Would you please leave that to the jury description? <clears throat> My name is Elmer Bud Christian Jr. I'm the father of SBO Buddy, Elmer Buddy Christian III. Um, one of the most basic goals of a father is to shield and and protect his children. On March the 22nd, 2011, I failed to do that. <clears throat> During the commission of a crime, Jamie Hood shot and killed my firstborn son, SPO Buddy Christian. I gave my son my name, even though I knew it would be confusing having three people in the family with the same name, but I wanted him to carry on the family name and our family traditions. Now my father is gone, and so is Buddy. I can only hope that people will remember the great man that Buddy was. I was so proud. when Buddy was asked to be a deacon at Hull Baptist Church, and he chose to follow in my footsteps by accepting that position. He joined the Hull Volunteer Fire Department and became a firefighter as well as their chaplain. But he served his church faithfully, not only as a deacon, but also as a Sunday school teacher and a Moana youth leader, just to list a few. Birthday parties, backyard gatherings, holiday celebrations, and other family activities will no longer be the same for me. What was once something to look forward to now has become the things that I dread the most. Things that I took for granted in the past, I have now have problems with. The simple things like getting a good night's sleep or concentrating on my job these things elude me. I can't even sit down and enjoy a TV program or go shopping for groceries without seeing or hearing something that reminds me of Buddy. When this happens, I struggle to keep my composure. My faith in God is the only thing that sustains me. As a father, I want to fix things. I want to solve problems as they arise, <clears throat> but in this case, however, there, was no, I, I, there is no solution. There is no way to remedy what has happened. 
I promised my wife that nothing would ever happen to Betty as a police officer, um, but again, I failed. This failure leads me to feelings of depression that prevents me from living a normal life. It also prevents me from being able to provide for my family as I should uh, and from being the father that I should be uh, to my other son and a good husband to my wife. I just keep telling myself that there was nothing I could do. But that's a little comfort.
40 hour a week, you know, provide kind of job. Um, after that, I look for secondary work. How many total hours a week do you work? The job that I currently work, uh, the minimum hours are 45 hour a week. And then after that, uh, I'll go work security details or labor details. And I put in a minimum of at least 15 hours a week on the second job. And on the second job, depending on how much work there is out there, uh, it has been as much as anywhere from 30 hours a week extra. Does the additional income go towards household wants or household needs? Um, I guess you could kind of say it's a little bit of both household wants and needs. Um, I've been married almost 15 years and we have two children. And um, where I live, the county I live in, the, uh, the school system is a good school system. But uh, we're a real uh, religious family. And uh, so I wanted my children to go to a Christian private school. And, uh, you know, not saying that my, my county school is not a good school. That's just where I wanted them to go. And so me working with the extra security and the extra details allows them to be able to go to a private school. And that's the main objective right now. In the past, it, it has been uh, material things. You know, I promised my wife a new vehicle. Eight years after marriage, I was able to buy her first new car and things like that. But up till now, it has been for material gain, I guess. Is this decision to work a second job a long-term or a short-term decision? I'd say long-term. Uh, as long as I can work and I'm able to work, I'm going to work. Um, it, you know, there, there's you know consequences of it, but um, you know, it, it, I think that's my job. Uh, that's how I was raised. You know, I was taught that um, if a if a guy can work, he needs to work, and if he can, he needs to provide, and he needs to do the best he possibly can do. So um, until health reasons or until I feel uh, just totally burned out, uh, I'll keep working. Safe. In what ways do you think that the additional time required to work multiple jobs affects people's lives and families? It's going to affect it. Um, now we have two children. Uh, my oldest daughter will be five in January, and my son just recently turned two. And it's to the point where even if I just go outside because I forgot something in the truck, as soon as I'm walking out the door, my two-year-old comes in there and goes, bye, Daddy, because he thinks I'm going to go stay with him. Um, he, he doesn't see me a lot uh, as much as he probably could. But the time that I am off, uh, it is very, very, very valuable. And it goes to my, my children and to my wife. Uh, of course, she works, you know, Monday through Friday, you know, the nine to five kind of job. So if it's during those hours, of course, um, you know, that suffers there. But, um, you know, one of my kids has just started pre-K, gets out early. The other one's not even in school yet. So the time off is very valuable, very important. But yes, it does um, get in on your personal life. Um, a lot of my jobs require me to work weekend nights. And, you know, that's when my wife's off work and when she wants to have family time, but she has kids to herself. Christian Griffith. Ma'am, you were the wife of Elmer Buddy Christian before his death? I was. I'm going to ask you to slide a little closer and make adjusted somewhat. We'll try that. So. And how long have y'all been married at the time of death, ma'am? Fifteen years. Did y'all have any children together? We do. We have two. What are their names and ages? Callie is nine years old and Wyatt is six. 
ma'am, uh, did you prepare a number of photographs to uh, be brought forward at this time? I did. Let me show you what the mark that states exhibit 1226. DVD that I recorded of Buddy. Uh, it would have been February 2011. They were playing in the floor at the house, and I just happened to video them. It was a video of him and your, your children? Right, Callie and Wyatt. And, they and on that particular video, the uh, sound has been muted, is that correct? Yes. And I would tender State Exhibit uh, all those photographs that are marked in State Exhibits as indicated, as well as the DVD, State Exhibit 14. I'm going to show those. They just stop for a few. They kind of do more like a slide show, I guess, rather than going through every bar, rather than uh, having to stop on each one. That would be on the elbow. Is that why? Yes, sir. Is this where you Yes, sir, it is. Okay. We can watch what you call it. Ms. Christian, there is a laser there on the front of you. Probably junior year. Speak up just a little Sorry. bit or pull that to them, okay? That was probably our his junior year of high school. When did y'all meet, ma'am? We were 16, so junior year. Did y'all go to the same high school together? We did not. Well, 27 was what, ma'am? That would have been our senior prom. schools we had each school's function so twelve thirty one taking that. I think this was a friend of ours um, wedding that we actually went to. Twelve thirty two. We had gone to um, the beach with my grandparents. That's my grandfather in the picture as well. Another beach picture. At the beach as well. He went with a, with us with our family. Twelve thirty five. That's uh, Buddy's graduation picture.
This one was a picture we had made at our church for the directory, I believe. Our engagement picture. Wedding day. Our wedding day, uh, February 17th, 1996. I'm sorry? February 17th, 44. This was at our house, um, our first house we bought, and our, our new puppy. That's 12.44. 12.45. This was our Christmas picture, our horses and our, our dog. Our horses important to you and or Buddy? Yes. Um, I grew up with them, and Buddy learned them uh, as being part of me, so. Buddy is a big John Deere fan, so it was a, a vacation that we went on. My granddad restored old tractors, so that was one of his tractors. Uh, Buddy's favorite trunk. We had a, I think this was a cookout we had for Buddy's parents for their anniversary. And um, Buddy's wearing his fire department helmet. And my, that's my grandfather. So was that where he was with the volunteer fire department at home? He was. I think this was taken at my grandparents' house. And that one as well. at our house again with Ginger. Girl, um, Buddy decided since I loved horses so much he needed to learn how to trim their feet so he went to Kentucky to the horse school and we visited the park while we were there. This was an anniversary trip that we I think this is uh, Bud and Carolyn's anniversary uh, dinner that we had for them at our house. That is Brother Jason in the middle? Yes. Uh, no, Jason's on the end. On the other yes, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Buddy in the middle? Yes. 1259. <laughs> um, he was a volunteer fireman for Hull, and this is their picture, and he also became the chaplain of the fire department while he was there. Twenty-second birthday. This is uh, Buddy and his dad. This is a picture of um, the gentleman on the lowest step. It is Clarence Christian, and then the next three are Elmer Senior, uh, Junior, and Buddy was the third. So four generations. This is a Christmas picture with my grandparents and my mom. Uh, this is at one of my cousin's weddings. Well, 
This is when he first, um, Ms. Allman, the police department, I believe that was in 2003. This was his uh, um, police academy graduation. This is our um, puppy we got right after he graduated um, Cisco. And Buddy's tractor. <coughs> this is a Christmas picture where he had moved to a, a different house. We had gone on a cruise, our first cruise with some friends. Well, 77. He was on the uh, motorcycle unit at the PD for several years. Well, 78. This is when Callie was born, 2006. Took her to the to the mountains. Callie's first birthday. Um, this was her first trip to the beach. Um, this is uh, Jason and Buddy and Callie. Jason on the left as you look at the photo? Yes. Um, this is one of Callie's fondest memories is blowing bubbles and playing, so she always loved that. This is uh, Jason and Buddy. Jason's on the left. Another favorite memory of Callie is swinging. Is what? Um, Buddy and Jason and some of their friends had gone on a motorcycle ride to the mountains. This is the playhouse that Buddy and his dad and Jason built um, for the kids. This is 
know why it was born, um, This is a um, Thanksgiving dinner at um, Carolyn's parents' house. So that's um, Carolyn's parents and then Carolyn's mom's mom, I believe. Buddy returned back to the PD after Wyatt was born, uh, so it would have been, um, I believe, early on in 2009, around January, I believe. This is Wyatt's dedication. Christmas at, uh, at my family. This is one of our first family trips. We went to Stone Mountain. afternoon shift so we would on Saturdays get up and go to the park or something before he would go into work so that's what we were doing here. Uh, this is um, Callie with um, actually one of a uh, badge that Buddy kept in his wallet and his hat. This uh, Easter picture. You know when that was? That would have been Wyatt's first Easter, I believe, so 2009. And they were having swimming lessons. This is a picture at Callie's horse show. Jason's in this picture as well, to the side. Callie's on, Callie's on the horse, and then Buddy's back's facing us. This would be Wyatt's first birthday. A 
against Mama's judgment, Daddy bought the little girl a four-wheeler. And she loved every minute. <laughs> I believe this is Christmas um, 2010, or I'm sorry, 2009. Um, but he was promoted to senior police officer. This is uh, Wyatt's first beach trip. It was um, Myrtle Beach, um, July of 2010. Yes, that was, um, we were leaving the beach that day and so we were taking some last pictures. Buddy was helping Callie carve a pumpkin. This would have been our church's fall festival. Callie was dressed. Um, yes, and she was dressed up as Tinkerbell. And Wyatt was Bob the Builder. This is Wyatt's second birthday party. And this would have been our, our last Christmas, um, of, um, so December 2010. This is Callie's fifth birthday party at, at Pump It Up. And, uh, this would have been in February of 2011. And, and this would be the, the day of the funeral. Getting ready to go. Yeah. It was. Um, people lined the streets as we were going from the Classic Center to the memorial, to the cemetery. This is um, 
the engraving of Buddy's name on the wall at the National Memorial in D.C. This is Callie and Wyatt, our first trip to D.C. It would have been May 2012. Uh, the first year families, when the names are added to the wall, you place a wreath, a flower on the wreath. So that's what we were doing. Um, the kids draw and make posters to take to the wall in D.C. me and Callie. The kids um, had worn little uniforms to D.C. that first year. So. This is Callie's kindergarten graduation. This was one of our um, first trips to the cemetery. I think it must have been Father's Day because we don't have a marker there or anything yet. This is Buddy's name etched on the uh, memorial, the Georgia Police Memorial. Christmas um, 2012, I'm sorry, 11. And Callie and Wyatt, um, I believe this was a birthday when we had gone to the cemetery. And we usually kids like to let balloons go, so we would, they make cards and we send our balloons to heaven. Some more cards the kids had made. This is uh, Bud and Carolyn and I and the kids and I believe this was for Buddy's birthday, we were letting balloons go. Some more posters they had made for the next year for the memorial in D.C. This is the Georgia uh, Memorial Wall. It's a moving wall that can be taken to different places. It has all the names of the Georgia police officers that were killed in line of duty. And Buddy's name is on there. This is a carry the load that comes through Athens uh, yearly, and Kelly and Wyatt participated in that. This is a memorial service we had for Buddy. That's Wyatt looking at his picture. had a candlelight service that night. The kids had drawn pictures on the little bags. This is the um, police memorial in Florida. Wyatt etching his daddy's name. And Callie. This will be another poster for the next year, Memorial DC. Georgia moving wall again. What is that 5K? Yes, um, we have a memorial 5K each year in everybody's memory. This was Father's Day. Callie had uh, 
wrote a little card she attached to her balloon. This was a card she had made. She remembered us going to Stone Mountain, so she drew um, the, the sky left at Stone Mountain in her family. She wrote about her and Daddy flying kites. This was a picture she drew. I believe this was um, in pre-K or kindergarten of Daddy's uniform. Why I drew this one. This was a, a card Callie had made. I believe it was for this year's Father's Day. There are pictures they did for this year's memorial in D.C. This is um, Callie. As I said, one of her favorite memories is blowing bubbles. So she's right beside her daddy's name on the wall, and she's blowing bubbles. And she's pointing to his name on the wall. Um, I had just finished the police unity tour. It's a bicycle ride to honor our fallen officers. And we ride through the memorial. This is Callie and Wyatt at the reflection pool at the National Memorial in D.C. and the thin blue line, light shining. Callie Wyatt, um, their fall picture, most recent oh. picture.
Ma'am, did you prepare a uh, system impact statement? I did. Let me show you what's been marked as State Exhibit 1436. That's your statement, ma'am. It is. And I would tender State Exhibit 1436 in there. You need that. Ma'am, if you will, would you give that to the jury? Speak to the microphone the best you can. It was winter of 1992. I was 16, and my best friend and I went on a double date with her boyfriend and his best friend. I remember it like it was yesterday. We met at her house and went to eat at Oscar's on Baxter Street and watched the movie A Few Good Men at the theater that was inside George's Square Mall. After our date, we went back to my friend's house. We hugged goodnight and I went inside. All I could think was, wow, this guy had the most beautiful green eyes. I sure hope he calls me again. He was so excited that upon leaving the porch, he completely missed the steps and fell off the front porch. I didn't know about this until he called me the next day because he was embarrassed, but really wanted to go out with me again. So needless to say, it was love at first sight for both of us. We were seldom apart from that day forward. We graduated high school in 1994 and set off to conquer the world together. We were married on February 17, 1996. It was the most beautiful day and everything was perfect because I was marrying the man that God had sent to make me whole. Buddy became a jack of all trades. There was not much he did not know how to do. He was a fireman, electrician, mechanic, lineman, farrier, plumber, officer, etc. But the titles he held most dear were fireman chaplain, deacon, interim youth pastor, husband, and father. He loved his church and family above all else. In January of 2006, God blessed us with our first child. He called her his buttercup and was so in awe of her tiny, beautiful existence that when he went out to tell our family that she was here, he could not utter a word. He could only hold up his coat shirt with pride, showing them the tiny footprints They left a mark, not only on his shirt, but on his heart forever. She had him wrapped around her little finger from that moment on. In October of 2008, God blessed us with our second child. He called him his little man and dreamed of all the things this father and son would do together. He dreamed of playing ball, teaching him to ride his bike, and of course motorcycle when he was old enough. But above all else, he would teach him how to be like dad and take care of mom and sister. Our little family was growing, and we loved every moment. I remember the countless nights he and I stayed awake together because one of the babies could not sleep, or well, the nights I heard him telling her about her stories and rubbing her back until she went to sleep. I remember when he was proud of the playhouse he and his dad and brother built for the kids. He loved watching Callie swing and slide and held Wyatt's hand as he climbed climbed the steps and pushed him in the swing as he fell asleep. We were living in a small barn apartment that Buddy and I had finished together on our farmland. We had dreams of building our home and raising our children on this farm. We even had a house plan picked out and Callie had already picked out her room. I remember well the day we staked out our house on the hill. The grass was tall and why it was so small I had to hold him. And Callie helped her daddy drive in the stakes. He was so proud to be providing for his family and giving us a future. February 17, 2011, we celebrated our 15th wedding anniversary. Life seemed to be so perfect, and our future was waiting to be written. But Tuesday, March 22nd, would forever set our lives on a different course. It started out like any other day. Buddy went to work and I took the kids to grandma's and to school, then went to work myself. Buddy called me as usual at lunchtime to check in and see how I was doing. He told me he was having a good day and was going to skip his workout and come straight home because he wanted to wash his motorcycle. We ended our conversation with I love you, and little did we know that that would be our last words ever spoken to each other. A mere hour later, 
Letting it be in the presence of our Lord. At the moment I learned of this news, all I wanted to do was run to him and hold his hand. I thought, this has to be a nightmare. Please just wake me up. In an instant, my children and I were deprived of so many things. We had our whole future in front of us. I thought we would grow old together and be there with each other as we took our last breath. But I was even denied this and had to wait four days before I could hold my precious buddy's hand because his body was now part of a crime scene. Our entire life flashed before my eyes. I realized I would never again see those beautiful green eyes I fell in love with on this side of heaven. We would never watch our children go together. We would never build that house on the hill together. We would never sit on our porch holding hands and rocking together. But above all else, I now realized I had to tell my two precious babies that their daddy, who loved them so much, would not be returning home from work that day or any other day. Callie was only five and Wyatt was only two. How were they to understand why their dad was never going to come home again? The days that followed were such a whirlwind. I felt as though I was on autopilot, merely going through the motions I knew I had to do. All I wanted to do was hide under a rock somewhere and never come out. My rock, my cornerstone, love of my life was, was gone from this world forever. How could I continue without him? But I know that God has a plan for me, and I have two babies who are counting on me to take care of them. I thought learning of this news would be the hardest thing I would ever have to do. Then I thought telling my babies about the loss of their father would be the hardest thing. But what proved to be the hardest was as the weeks and years unfolded, and I would hold them and comfort them as they missed him so very much. It was then that I knew this would be a daily struggle for the rest of my life. Their innocence was taken, and they learned of death at such an early age. Their young lives should be filled with joy and laughter, not missing their father and worrying that life is so fragile. Every holiday from that day forward would be difficult. Christmas is a time for family. And what is Father's Day or Mother's Day without your spouse or father to share it with? Now we spend each holiday with a trip to the cemetery. The kids write their daddy letters and we send balloons to heaven for him. I learned that as long as I live, each day will be a struggle to keep moving forward and learning how to live life without being sure to share it with. <coughs> Those first few days, Callie just wanted her daddy to hold her so badly. At the funeral, she couldn't understand where they were taking her daddy. She tells me often that she misses him. He would never again get to tell her stories, rub her back until she fell asleep, push her in the swing, fly a kite in the yard, blow bubbles or play on the floor, or make paper airplanes. He would never be there when she lost her first tooth, when she graduated kindergarten, learned to ride her bike or rode her horse all by herself. He would never get to walk his little girl down the aisle as she married her best friend. When she sees movies like Rose in her brain, she can identify all too well with the child that has lost one or both parents. Now she's afraid of, ha of things happening to others she loves and often won't let me out of her sight for fear of losing me as well. Wyatt cried every time the phone rang because he thought it was Daddy and he didn't understand why he couldn't talk to him. He thought Daddy was at work and would come home any day. He would ask me often, why is that Daddy coming? Each time he heard a motorcycle or someone riding the tractor, he would say, it's Daddy, it's Daddy. Wyatt still has trouble understanding why Daddy cannot come home and why he cannot go to him. He never got to have his dad in his first day of preschool, kindergarten graduation, teach him to play football, ride his bike or motorcycle. He'll never get to stand beside his boy 
as his best man on his wedding day. Since he has now had more years without his daddy than with his daddy, yeah, than with his dad, he has very few memories of him and longs to have him play with him again. When he sees other children and their daddies playing, he will ask, he'll ask me, did daddy play with me like that? When asked to summarize how this loss has impacted me, I don't know where to start or where to end. How can I summarize a story that was not supposed to end so soon? We had our whole lives ahead of us. This will forever be a work in progress. I will always struggle with this void I feel in my heart. And my children will forever long for their father who loves them so very much. There will be many more sleepless nights because the baby cannot, babies cannot sleep. But instead of him and me staying up together, it will be me accompanying them because he is gone. Each day I wake up, I think about him. Throughout the day, I think about him. And each night before I go to bed, I think about him. Some days I can be strong and soldier on. The others I just want to hide under that rock again. It's like there's a band-aid over my heart. Sometimes it holds and sometimes it does not. Yes, we will continue to trust in the Lord. We will finish those dreams we set out to do. We will live, live on for him because he would want us to. But there will always be one thing missing. Our life will never be the same without him to share in it. This community will never be the same without Buddy's smile and caring heart. He loved his job, and the best thing was caring for others. He thought his day was complete if he could bring joy and a smile to someone else's day. He loved passing out stickers or toys to kids, helping people find their way, or simply being a great listener. His memorial service was packed, and people lined the streets to pay respect to someone who had given their life so selflessly. I received countless letters from people who say that they met my husband once, but the impact that he left on their life will last forever. Or people who say I never met him, but I sure wish I had. He posthumously received the Military Order of the Purple Heart. His name will forever be etched on the Georgia Public Safety Memorial Wall, the National Police Memorial Wall in, D in Washington, D.C., and the Police Hall of Fame in Florida. He received countless other titles and honors, but as your most renowned titles and honors are child of God, son, grandson, brother, cousin, friend, husband, and father. He was a hero, not because of how he died, but because of how he lived. The world will never know of the great things he could have continued to do. Just the mere act of writing this statement has given me much anxiety. How can I sum up his life, character, love, and compassion in only a few pages? But he loved God and others with every fiber of his being. Our children, our family, our community, and I will grieve and ache the loss of him with every fiber we have until the day we see him again in heaven. At this time, I'd like to play uh, Exhibit 1437. Uh,
I won't say most likely, but when you're doing something out of prejudice, you leave me no choice. I've been over backwards to the point where I have to say this. I'd like to make this objection for the rest of you. And I would like to move for a mistrial and object to the further entry of a picture of Officer Christian. There is simply no, no way one can undo the prejudice created in the, in the minds of the jurors after viewing such inflammatory plus heart wrenching material. The photo were prejudicial inflammatory plus irrelevant to the issue at hand especially given the stream number of pictures of family vacation, family celebration pictures of children writing fathers, uh, writing father day birthday card made by children for their decorated father, their, I'm sorry, deceased father. The motion is made for to the 4th, 5th, 6th, 8th Amendment of the United States Constitution plus all applicable parts of, Georgia, of the Georgia Constitution. The purpose of these pictures is clear and it is improper the picture was designed to create this impermissible, this impermissible level of emotions. We hear for Officer Christian. Why well, bring up kids writing all this him? And there was so many of them. I read a case where 20, they gave him a new case, a new trial of 20 pictures. They introduced so many pictures, I can't count them. And we're here for Officer Christian. He's like, we're not here to inflame. Why bring kids in? It speak for itself. I done wrote the apology letter on the night they have. I done turned myself in. I told them whatever they want. I can't do no more than what I've done. So I have no choice from the top to the bottom. I have took it to the point. I let them finish the trial because I want to bring the man's family some closure. But at the same time, I can't let you keep on doing it in any type of way. They didn't want too far. This wasn't even necessary. So I done made my objection. And I didn't want to do it, but it's, it seemed to me getting worse, 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 and worse. And it really just, I know everybody hurt. I understand them. But let's keep it, let's, let's, let's keep it professional. Let's don't do something for Big James out of passion. Let's just keep it professional and let the justice system take its course correctly. So I made that for the judge because it getting worse. If I got to keep on making these new trials, just I will. I let them finish the trial for you, judge, but I ain't finna about a gift for nobody putting on their rope and they ain't doing it for the right reason. That's why I stand. Mr. Maul, you want to respond? All the pictures that were submitted through the Carolyn Christian family photo album, they're not going to be able to submitted the ones that were submitted to the defendant and to the court. And And I can, I can let a lot of stuff go to the point where I could have had a new trial, but I'm not here for that. But this to the point I'm not volunteering letting nobody put me on death row, and especially when it's not done it when it's not done the right way. If we gonna do it, let's do it the right way. Let's don't make them soft serve out of the situation already bad. So I made my objection for the record. How you? That's, that's what I'm really looking for the judge, the record, and I done, and I done made the objection, and I can't do no more than that. So just to be clear, are you both making a motion for a mistrial? What well, at the sentencing phase, not the whole trial, but the sentencing phase. Is, is that what we at the sentencing yes. phase? Yes. I'm not going to do it like that. That's where we are. Motion for mistrial denied. The court notes that on May the 27th, 2015, there was a hearing where all of this evidence was brought forward. And um, my recollection, my notes indicate that's further evidence in my order that the only picture that was objected to was titled Funeral 6 JPEG. Uh, this is the order that followed a uh, um, few days after that. So. And that was removed. Yeah. Big part. And that was removed and not included in That's the order. Yeah. 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 Y
just for the record, sir, I had filed a motion to ask you and the D how to use down my accounts also. So, you remember that? I asked you how I filed a motion to how to use my stand my accounts. Yes. Remember that motion? So, during the March May 27, I didn't even consult with my stand by counsel because of the turmoil we were going through and that motion hadn't been answered at that time. So again, I can object when I want to. Just because uh, I didn't object to all of them then, I have consulted with staff by counsel and I have educated myself up. So that don't prevent me from making an objection or making an objection for a mistrial. And I, you know, whatever you rule, I'm gonna keep going on, but I also wanna make, it, make a continuing objection as far as a mistrial to the excessive use of these pictures that they continue to bring in here that have no relevance to Officer Christian's death. And I would just like to create the record and that's what I'm doing. So I would note, Judge, also, I don't recall as far as all the ones that were tendered and admitted to uh, Alyssa Christian, that if I recall correctly, he basically said no objection to the admissibility of those pictures that we just uh, displayed to the jury. Again, Judge, I can make an objection when I want to. He can't tell me when. So, again, I've done what I've done for the record. And you're going to handle your trial the way you want to handle it. It just, I can dump with all I can do. All right. So again, the motion for Mr. Charles tonight and your objection is um, noted. Ready to come back in? Yes, sir. Is it ready to come back in? So it may, I mean, I'd say you have time. I'm out. That's fine. 